we look at then the, the carburizing depth of the case as a function of time, uh, in a uh, carburizing atmosphere, and this, by the way, if I remember correctly, is a case that is in a, in a pack, in a solid pack material. Uh, here we find that in time, we just get the, the depth of the case to increase. Looks like that. This is the curve you most often see for carburizing and depth of case. It's just plotted out linearly, and you can find it exactly for a given period of time how depth the case will go, how deep the case will go. Yes? What would the effect of a liquid or gaseous carburizing environment be on that graph? Would you stretch it out more in time? Well, we'll look at that in a moment. I have a slide that will do the comparison oh. on that. <clears throat> but one of the things that is interesting to us, something that we'd really like to know, is if it's possible to predict that. Uh, and it has to do with the diffusion of carbon in, in the steel, but the composition of the steel is changing continuously. We're diffusing through a higher and higher carbon content. So the math in that becomes a little bit complicated. But if we move along in a position and, and see uh, what's going to happen now if uh, instead of having a pack carburized material, we have a, a carbonitrided material. Uh, and if we look at the hardness versus the depth, and actually I selected these to jump back and forth from hardness to carbon content in the material, but it, it makes a little difference because it's going to show you uh, from the surface inside what it looks like. And in this particular case, this is a carbon nitriding, and this is gaseous carbon nitriding in this particular case. And so we find that the hardness is going to be directly related to the carbon content. And so as the micro hardness drops off, it means the carbon content is decreasing. And you notice that for 1018 steel, it's entirely different, different than from an 8620 steel. And you notice in the surface of the material, we have a decrease in the hardness as well. And that's actually due to decarb of the surface of the material. That means uh, at the end of the cycle or because of the treatment of the piece before it started, it was decarbed. And we didn't have as much carbon in that area to, as we did to start with. <coughs> If we look at carbon nitriding and look at the uh, depth versus the temperature for the material in the 1020 steel uh, for various times, and this, by the way, now is a situation for uh, carbon nitriding, and it's going to be gaseous carbon nitriding in, in this particular case. Uh, and we look at, at it for different times, that is, for 15 minutes for total time in the furnace, uh, I'm very sorry, this is not gaseous carbon nitride, and this is liquid uh, gas carbon nitride, and this is in cyanide solution. So this is 15-minute treatment, a 30-minute treatment, and a 45-minute treatment. And the depth of the case, of course, is increasing rather radically as we change the time. And so for a 45-minute time uh, in the bath, we have a, a quite a nice depth of penetration of the case for this particular material. If we did this for uh, 11, 12 steel, uh, we find that the situation uh, would be something slightly different. And uh, in this particular case, the depth is going up uh, rather rapidly. And this is just in a 15-minute period that we have done about what we did in the oven, as I recall it, in about 45 minutes. So it says that the alloy composition that we're going to use is going to make a lot of difference in the depth of penetration that we have. And then we have to do this business of finding out <coughs> something about the hardness characteristics, that is, uh, how, how does the hardness really vary? And so we can do this. We're going to use a noop indenter now. Remember the little rhombic indenter that we used? And so you notice that the curve that we get here, this particular curve, is reminiscent of the Jomini hardenability curve that we had, right? Except in the Jomini hardenability curve, we're quenching one end, and we're looking at the hardness variation as a function of the rapidity of cooling. In this particular case, we have carburized the material, we have a, a case on it, and we want to know how hard that particular case is at a given depth. And so we're going to do this low angle cutting of it, and we're going to do little noop indentions, and they are shown actually at the very bottom here. You see the noop indentions. As the noop indention gets bigger and bigger and bigger, that means that the material is becoming softer and softer and softer. And so for effective hardness in this, for this noop number, it goes to this particular depth. That's as, and then it begins to drop off and, and goes back to the base material at this hardness. 
<coughs> now, you can, you can do this for any kind of hardness that you want. You get curves that look similar to this, but not necessarily having such a flat section. Some of them will, will go almost linearly from the point down to the basic hardness of the material. And it depends upon what you're carburizing. So you need to know those particular characteristics if you're going to design or designate uh, something that's in it. If you look at the next slide, we're going to see the effect of that retained austenite on the surface. And this is a different steel, a, a different specimen. Again, we're looking at the new hardness. And you notice that in the very surface of the material, when we haven't penetrated very far, that the material is softer than it is down below. And so that means we, we are going to have done something, either decarburized the surface or done something else. Now, the something else you can do is, for this particular steel is, you can cool it fast enough, the surface can get cooled fast enough if you haul it over the furnace so that you retain some austenite. And so, in reality, in this specimen, that surface condition that's right there has to do with retained austenite. And then, starting here, we have the standard drop-off that we have examined before in the material. <coughs> if you want to look at uh, perhaps a whole array of the curves together to see what you really get. Uh, you get a, a curve that looks something like this. And I think this responds to the question that you uh, asked uh, about uh, the gaseous nitrocarburizing of the material. <coughs> and so what we've done here is we're uh, carburizing the material in a nitrocarburizing gaseous material. We're looking at a number of different steels, nitro alloy and AISI 8620, H13, AISI 410, and AISI 1015 are different grades of steel. Well, number one, they're all subjected to the carburizing temperature of 570 degrees C. They're, they're all treated exactly the same way. But the hardness level that we get isn't the same, nor is the profile of the hardness as a function of, diff of the distance the same. I guess my students normally ask me, why would anybody ever select one that's down here? Why would anyone use this 1015 steel and get a curve that looks like that when you can use this steel and you can get the hardness to penetrate much deeper? Well, we're back to lesson one now. We've got to decide whether this material costs more money. If we're really going to be over designing, if we need to do that, do we need the properties at the lower level that we have for this particular material? Is it advantageous in any way for us to do that? Because if it is, then okay, we can put a case on it that's very beneficial. But if we only need a very fractional uh, surface hardening on the material, if we know that the, the lifetime of the piece, the design lifetime of the piece, is going to be reached far before we're ever going to wear the material out by attrition, we're going to fail it some other way. If the body of the car is going to wear out before this particular uh, case carburized piece is wears out, then there's no sense in buying a uh, more expensive steel. We'll use the 1015 steel if in the carburizing treatment we don't change its properties because it's up in the temperature range now where it's going to anneal itself so we can't depend upon it being strain hardened anymore. So if it in that anneal condition, that depth of case is satisfactory, then you pluck it out and use it. Maximum hardness is produced by the most severe quench, the right chemical composition, and maximum austenitic grain size. Grain size of hyperutectoid is readily apparent, but hyperutectoid steels must be treated in a carbon-rich bath to make their surface hyperutectoid and hence their austenitic grain size apparent. The longer the carburizing time, the deeper the case. Carbon content depends on composition of the alloy being carburized, as well as the time and temperature of the carburizing process. <laughs> that's, that's sort of the story on, on carburizing, on case carburizing the material, except for one thing. A lot of times we want to carburize a surface. We want to harden the surface by carburization. And we want to stop the carburization at a particular point. We don't want the rest of it carburized. And let's say then, in some sort of a, a brake pedal device, we want the material carburized where we're going to have a friction wear, a bearing surface to wear. 
and right next to it, we do not want it carburized. We want the rest of the material to stay as it was before. So how do you stop it from carburizing one area when it's, you want it to carburize the other area? And it turns out that it's pretty simple. All you have to do is find a crystal lattice in which the carbon does not squirt through the, the crystal lattice. Find a material that you can plate on the surface that the carbon can't penetrate. And a nice material to do this with is copper. So we can copper plate the outside of the material where we don't want it carburized, carburize the whole thing, and find out that where the copper was, we didn't carburize it, and where the rest of the material was left naked, we did carburize it. So for instance, you could put your initials on a carburized sheet if you want and leave it uncarburized. Or we can do all sorts of tricks that look like that. <coughs> well, as I started out saying, heat treatment of carburized parts is also possible. The hardness levels that you've show, seen in all of these slides have to do with just the material carburized. However, you can, if you want, heat treat that piece and get an appreciably higher hardness level. And you can change the curves then to move into a different commodity, if you want, a different material completely. And I suppose, lastly, I should say that one of the big problems we have in carburizing for little parts, like bits, drill bits, is you don't want to do them one at a time. And so we want to put them in a bath so that we have complete coverage of the carburizing material around it and a complete temperature around it that's the same temperature so we know what we're doing. And the fluidized bed treatment of such things is absolutely great. So now we can use fluidized beds of, say, aluminum oxide, put the bits in it, crowd them together if you want, get a uniform temperature throughout the bed, a uniform conditioning, that means atmosphere around it, so we can get homogeneous carburization of many, many pieces in one little vessel at one time if they're very small. And if we don't do that, we have to worry always about protecting the piece so it's not stagnant. The atmosphere is not stagnant at a point. We get carburization everywhere except one point. Well, that I think is uh, just about does it for the ferrous materials. We find out how to strengthen them. There are lots of different ways and lots of tricks. We can do heat treatment, work hardening, uh, cause the material to be case carburized or case treated. Uh, we can alloy it in many, many different ways. And steel is one of the biggest things we use. And you'd say, OK, having finished that, then that's probably the end of metallurgy. But the fact of the matter is, iron's just one element that sits out there. And we've got the whole periodic table. So we're going to have to look at, at the non-ferrous materials to see something about them, their, their uses, how we get them, and, and whatnot. And we'll pick that up in the next lecture.